Hello, students of statics, this is Dr. Dan Baker. And in today's video, we're gonna introduce a new chapter. And this new chapter is friction. Now, I know that all of you have some background in friction because friction is also covered in physics, which you have all taken and passed in order to get here into statics. So I'm gonna focus on mainly the things that might have been a misconception that you're bringing with you into statics, and then we'll move from there. So this idea of friction, let me go ahead and give a definition here of friction, is that friction are shear forces developed between contacting surfaces so one of the interesting things about friction is that friction is typically available even if it's small amounts of friction uh, but it's not always used Okay, so the times when we need friction fundamentally are when we have an imbalance of forces and we can develop this um, interaction between surfaces. Okay, so let's start with a problem sketch. Let's say that we have a box and this box is sitting here on a non-horizontal surface and the box has a given weight. And let's say that we are pushing this box, this block up the ramp, okay? So noting for one, that our impending motion for this problem is going up the ramp, okay? We might have other problems that say, well, how big does P need to be in order to keep the block from sliding down the ramp? Okay, so this kind of also gives you an idea. We have to think about the impending motion to do the direction of the friction. We also then have to think about what is the problem asking to determine what amount of friction are they asking for. Not all problems are solved at impending motion, which is something that I think people come from physics with because many problems in physics are at impending motion. Fundamentally, if you're using the equation F is equal to mu sub S times N, this is only... at impending motion. I'll circle back to that equation and show you exactly when friction is not equal to uh, mu sub s, which is a friction coefficient times a normal force. Coming back to our free body diagram, our weight force always pulls toward the center of the earth. We had an external pushing force up the ramp. Now, one thing to highlight here is that normal forces are normal to a surface, okay? So there is my normal force. Normal forces are not always going through the centroid of a body, okay? So it turns out that this normal force would likely be somewhere down here. If we pushed hard enough, maybe it could move up in this direction. So we can find out here in statics that normal forces move. Okay, and the reason that they're actually moving is that normal forces come from a distributed load. Okay, let me just do a little sub problem down here. So if I made a free body diagram of a box on a horizontal surface, our normal force would look like the following. It would be a surface distributed load across that the bottom of that block. Now, if I put this block on an angle my normal force then I would actually have more force acting down here at the corner now the exact direction of this would probably look something like this this Okay, this would actually be the actual distributed load, where I'd have more of my weight shifted down to the lower corner, a little bit less of it up here. So the way that we model this distributed load, try to draw the same block here, with our weight force, is we model it with a normal force, once again, not always acting through the middle, and a friction force. Okay, and so this is our reality, and this is our model. 
Okay, so that kind of gives you an idea where this idea of a normal force and a friction force come from. They actually come from simplifying this um, distributed load, this changing value distributed load, which is not even perpendicular to the surface. Okay, but we basically can create a lateral load which takes care of the components in this direction, and then I saw a normal force. Okay, so realize a lot of the things that we do in engineering in general, we're coming up with models, and every model has hints of inaccuracies to it, but likely to, it likely covers most of the nuance um, of that topic. Okay, so coming back now to our free body diagram on top here. So if we're pushing the block and we want it to go up the ramp, the impending motion is going up, therefore our friction is coming back down. Okay, so friction is always parallel to a surface, normal force is always perpendicular to that surface. Now the other thing, and I mentioned this already, is that friction is not always at impending motion. It turns out there is a whole series of friction values which could keep this system static. Okay, so maybe a problem says, hey, what's the total range given this pushing force? What's the total range of friction values that could keep the system static? It would turn out that this would be the biggest friction at impending motion coming back down in this direction. Um, we would also have friction, say that we reduced our pushing force and we wanted just to keep the system static from sliding down the ramp, then the friction actually would swap directions and be pushing up um, up the ramp and would increase up to a value of impending motion in that direction. Okay, so impending motion is kind of like our bookends on either end. So let's take a look at what impending motion really means. So if we're looking at our friction force versus our pushing force, we actually can model friction like the following. Okay, we have a linear increase, it reaches a peak value and it comes down and it plateaus. Now, hopefully you've seen this curve before. So there's three different zones in here we wanna talk about. This one's gonna be one, this point here is going to be two, and then after it plateaus over here, we're gonna talk about three. So number one, we're going to say is static but not impending. And it turns out the equation for this is that F is less than mu sub s times n, okay? Because at mu sub s times n, we're at number two, this is impending motion. And at impending motion, we are at F, and I'm gonna put F sub max. Just to note here, this is the maximum amount of friction that's available. You can never have any more friction than at impending motion. And so this is equal to our friction coefficient mu sub s times our normal force n. And then our third zone over to the far right, so number three, this is where we get into kinetic motion or kinetic friction. And kinetic friction, we have a parallel equation here, F is equal to mu sub K times N. Okay, so three different zones and fundamentally three different relationships. In the first zone here, static but not impending, the system is not moving. We are using friction, but it is not yet equal to this ratio dependent on the coefficient of static friction. Let me put a little side note here that when we are static but not impending, we want to treat F and N, our friction and our normal, as independent variables. Okay, so if you cannot relate them by mu sub s, excuse me, f is equal to mu sub s times n, then they are in fact going to be independent variables and you're just gonna solve for them separately. Okay, just like there were variables x and y, f1 and f2, anything else, okay? So separate variables. 
uh, and then we have impending motion, and then we have kinetic friction. We mainly deal with kinetic friction as we get into dynamics. The only case where we deal with kinetic friction in statics, keep in mind that in statics we're not always talking about things that are not moving. In fact, the true definition in statics of what we're talking about is when acceleration is equal to zero. And so if you do have a constant velocity problem, we could deal with um, kinetic friction as long as the velocity doesn't change and acceleration stays equal to zero. Okay, one other concept that I wanted to cover as part of this video is this idea of relating the friction and normal by an angle. Okay, so if we have our weight force and now our pushing force, so there's two different options in how we can represent our friction and our normal. Now, one thing to notice here quickly is that you may assume that the normal force is going to act right here into the middle. And that's true if P is equal to zero. But actually, as you push harder and harder, this force is going to move over here to the right. And so if we represent this as our normal force, here as our friction force. And so we can add on to here that if we add together our friction and our normal, we can come up with our resultant force. Okay, so we often label this R. And so you wouldn't want to list your resultant force and your friction and your normal, assuming you're going to add all of them onto a free body diagram, because fundamentally use them either or. So let me put a little note here. I'll put use either F and N or the resultant R, okay? So either or. And so the first couple sections of friction will actually use the separate friction and normal forces. And then for most of the rest of the friction chapter, as we get into other topics, we'll use that resultant force. Now, the additional unknown, right, is so if we talk about that um, any vector has an unknown magnitude and also an unknown angle. So if we're only talking about the resultant magnitude, we're short one unknown. And we can pick up our second unknown with an angle. And this angle is this angle between the normal force and the resultant force, and so we call this the friction angle. So this is phi sub s. And this friction angle, because I can actually draw a right triangle, let me come in here, zoom in, Draw my little right triangle. So there's the base and there's my hypotenuse, right? That right triangle. And because I have a side and the hypotenuse, I also have the friction across the bottom. I can essentially write that my friction angle phi sub s, the tangent of phi sub s is equal to mu sub s. And of course, mu sub s is equal to f over n. Okay, so also noting that our friction angle, we'll side note here, only applies at impending motion. And it only implies an impending motion because we're assuming that this is true, right? And of course, this comes from F is equal to mu sub s times n, and we know that f is equal to mu sub s times n only happens at impending motion. Okay, so if you see a problem involving the friction angle phi sub s, know that it is an impending motion problem. So let's go ahead and jump into an example that's going to use friction. All right, so here is a friction example that we'll work through. And fundamentally, we have a wheel. This wheel rotates around point C. And pushing against the wheel at point B is a brake arm, okay? So we're gonna push against the wheel with this arm, and we're actually gonna push on it with a force of 100 Newtons up there at the top point. Another piece of information we're given in this problem is that mu sub s is equal to 0 0.4. 
Okay, so if we are at impending motion, then we can actually find um, what our friction would be at location B, at that contact point. And then as we're talking about this moment, fundamentally we have the moment applied to the wheel. And so this would be a moment, and this would be negative from the right-hand rule, wrapping your fingers around in the direction of that arrow tip. Now, additional information would be the geometry from the 100 to the contact point is 0 0.3 meters. 0.4 meters vertically down to the crossbar there. And then the width here from the contact point at B over to A is 0 0.2. All of these in meters. And then one last dimension, we have a radius of 0 0.2 for the wheel. Okay, so that gives us all of the different values. So now, fundamentally, what we have is a frame and machine problem that now includes friction. Okay, so you know in a frame machine problem that you want to include all of your applied loads. There's my moment. There is my 100 newtons. I do need an axis system. Let's go ahead and use a standard XY. You could draw this um, on either body. You can draw it beside. It doesn't technically matter. Now we need to add all the reaction forces. Okay, I have a pin here um, at C. So this would be CY and also cx and then i also have a pin over here at a so ax and we'll go with upwards here as well a y and then i have my interaction forces okay so here is where my friction is going to come into play and so the normal force here at point b so i'm going to draw it here to the right call this n sub b and they'll also have that normal equal and opposite over on the wheel. Now, as you think about impending motion, it's usually easiest to think about the impending motion and the friction in the body that's gonna actually start moving, okay? So if this moment gets large enough and breaks free of that friction, right, the impending motion will go downwards. Therefore, my friction force will go upwards. Right? Friction opposes motion on the body that we're talking about. And then equal and opposite for that friction as well. So the friction over here on the brake lever is going to be going downward. Okay, so once again, just a, an application of frames and machines now with friction. Let me go ahead and label these. This is free body diagram BC. This is free body diagram AB. Always useful, always useful to label those. So as you start to set up your equations of equilibrium, you can label which equations go with which free body diagrams. All right, so one hint that I'll give you is that as we deal with wheels, right, we have pin forces going through the middle of the wheel. Every single normal force, it wouldn't matter what angle the surface it was touching this wheel. And if it was a circular wheel, that normal force is going to go through the middle of the wheel. Okay, its line of action will line up with the middle of the wheel. And of course, friction forces are always going to be tangential. So often, if you have a wheel, certainly always sum your moments around the middle of that wheel can give you um, some really solid information. Okay, so actually let me do that up here. So this is going to be for BC. I am going to sum my moments around point C, and that's going to be equal to zero. So with those moments from the right-hand rule, I have that my moment applied is negative. So a negative M, that is a unknown. And then we have the friction force out at a radius of 0.2, that's positive, plus 0.2, times f and this is equal to zero right once again the normal force is passing through the middle now you may be wondering like how can you tell if a problem is an impending motion or static but not impending motion it really has a lot to do with extremal language notice in this problem it talks about the largest moment which will keep the wheel static this kind of extremal language tells you that this problem is at impending motion The largest angle, largest force. Um, sometimes it can be the smallest too, but often it's largest. Now notice in part B, there is no extremal language in part B. It simply says, if the moment is 16, what's the friction force? Okay, so just notice the difference between those. And so I'm gonna make an assumption on the bottom one here, this is going to be static, but 
not impending. Technically, it could also be pushed into kinetic if that moment was actually large enough. Um, but I'm going to go with this static but not impending assumption, and then I'll check it, okay? Because you can always check whether you're actually in static but not impending or you're at impending or you're above impending, which pushes you into kinetic. Fundamentally, by comparing your f is equal to mu sub s times n, um, gives you a relationship to compare across. All right, so because we are at impending motion, I also can do a substitution here that this friction is equal to mu sub s times n, right? Only because we are at impending motion. So let me then also, let me set this is n sub b. All right, so from my other free body diagram, which is a, b. Now, in this problem, we are not asked to solve for the pin forces, right? The pin forces at C or the pin forces at A. We're simply focusing on that friction and that normal. So let's go ahead and let's do an, another moment, and we'll sum moments around point A. Okay, so we're going to have a moment. It's going to be a positive moment from the 100 Newton force, positive moment from the friction force, negative moment from N sub B. Okay, and then no moment from those pin forces at A. So let's go ahead and write those out. So we are summing the moments at point A, and this is going to be equal to zero. And so we have the distance of 0 0.2 over to that friction force. I'll leave it for right now as F. And once again, that is going to be positive. And then two negative moments. Um, with n sub b, distance is 0 0.4 times n sub b, negative from the right-hand rule. And then additionally, I might have said this was negative earlier, but now looking at it here, vertically up, crossed into that 100 newtons is certainly going to be positive. R crossed into F, and so a positive 0 0.7 times 100, and that is equal to 0. So in this equation, we have two unknowns, but we can go ahead and do the same substitution here that F is equal to mu sub s, which is 0 0.4 times my normal force. Okay, and this is n sub b as well. And so now I have n sub b show up twice, which is totally fine, and can find out that n sub b, my normal force at b, is equal to 218.8 newtons, which then if I multiply that times 0.4, I find out my friction force is equal to 87.52 newtons. And I finally can solve for my moment, maximum moment to keep the system static is 17.5 newton meters. Okay, so that's what we're asked to solve for in this problem. So if the moment is less than 17.5 newton meters, the system will still be static. It just won't be at impending motion. And so that also gives the hint when we talk about what is the friction at 16 newton meters, again, less than 17.5. That helps us confirm that we're going to be in static but not impending. So the way we solve the static but not impending problem we actually end up using the same free body diagrams, okay? So no need to redraw your free body diagrams. We simply won't make that substitution that F is equal to mu sub s times n, okay? So coming down here to part B, we are again going to sum our moments at point C for the wheel. Okay, this is equal to zero. And so I have my minus m. Now I do know the value this time, and I'll substitute that in here in just a second. Um, plus my radius of 0 0.2 times my friction force, right? And this is equal to zero. So we said this moment is equal to 16. So notice in this equation now, we only have one unknown. And that one unknown is the friction force itself. And so this friction force is equal to 80 pounds. Okay, just a little note here that we're also using free body diagram BC is where that equation came from. All right, so if we revisit one more time our friction graph, okay, so here we're talking about our friction, and in this case we're talking about this normal force N sub B. Actually, instead of putting n sub b here, really it's related more to the moment, right? The moment on that wheel is driving the friction. 
And so what we found is that looks something like this. And so when our moment is small enough, as it was over here in the case um, where our friction, so at this point right here, our friction was equal to 80 when our moment was 16 Newton meters, right? That came from part B. And then as that moment increased here to 17.5 Newton meters, we ended up with a maximum friction available of 87.52 Newtons. If we further increase the moment past 17.5, we'd put it into a kinetic state. Now it turns out the kinetic friction is typically less than static friction, and that's because things are already moving. And when they're already moving, kind of the things can bump across each other at a higher rate than if they're sitting there and the surface regulators kind of settle in to each other. Okay, so that gives you an idea how we can solve a problem not only at impending motion, but also at static but not impending. And we notice that the language in the problem, this largest, um, like I said, what I call extremal language, pushing things to extremes, helped identify that this was an impending motion problem for part A. And then for part B, we used the same free body diagrams and we solved for the friction given the 16 Newton meter moment. And then we also plotted these onto our diagram so we can see how they're related between the friction and the moment. I appreciate your attention today and hope you're having a good one.